Justin Gatlin is the latest in a long line of sprint sensations to emerge from the USA. Gatlin got a good start. Look at this man coming through now. Gatlin. What a fantastic performance Gatlin. from Gatlin. 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 Ultimate goal is to be one of the best sprinters in history. And what a fantastic performance of Gatlin, and look at the time. It's the American leading the Jamaican at the moment. He knows, he is the world champion. Of Justin Gatlin is the world champion here in London. Hey, what's up, buddy? We back for another episode of Ready, Set, Go. It's your boy, Jay Gatlin, in the building. And you know, you know my trusted man who is over here with me, my homie, my day one, Rodney Green in the building, man. What's going on, baby? Man, what's going on, everybody, man? To our community out here, ready, set, go. Wanted to say thank you to all our fans that's been watching. Thank you to our community that's been tuning in, man. We are definitely loving it and enjoying bringing you good content. Exactly, man. We definitely want to say thank you all for listening in. You know, what we're doing right now is we're just trying to give y'all the feedback that you know that we all talk about. That barbershop kind of talk, that love. It's no diss, no hate. We just come out here just delivering the word and the things and the thoughts that we all think. So that's why we here. Ready, set, go, baby. So what we got left. What we got on the on top of the list for today, man? What's going on? What we had? Tom man, Jones was this weekend, right? Tom Jones was definitely this weekend. It was a, it was a great meet. Um, Florida Gators and um, Coach Mouse, Mike Holloway, put on a great show on for uh, a lot of international athletes, collegiate athletes, uh, along with the pro athletes. So shout out to the Gators and Coach Mouse, man. So is it safe to say, because me and you both Florida boys, we grew up in Florida, Florida relays was always a thing growing up, right? Is it safe to say that Florida relays has taken a backseat to Tom Jones now? Because the last couple of years, Tom Jones has seemed to really put on better performances than actually Florida relays. Man, this is true. You remember back in the day, man, when Dennis used to take us take us to Tom Jones to work on things. He used to be <laughs> like, hey, look, you're going there. It's like a low-key meet, like, you know... The crowd, you know, it'd be spots in there. You may see about four or five people in there, but it was more athletes than actually people in the stands. And, but now, that's a that's a negative, bro. That's oh, a yeah. negative. When you come to Tom Jones, you got to come ready. <laughs> yeah. That's that last meet before everything kicks off. Yes. Or yeah, everything so, kicks off. Yes, because, you know, right right after Tom Jones, is, is I think it's the start of the – no, nah, not I think. I know it's the start of the Diamond League. Listen, the last time I ran at Tom Jones, the lineup was damn near a world championship finals. I had to race against Andre DeGrasse. I had to race <laughs> against Noah Lyles. I was in there. Uh, Isaiah Young was in there. We, we were all in there, bro. Like, and that was a hot race. Hey, right, that's when you got your lick back, man. I still got that photo, man. We're going to put it We gonna put it in the chat, man. Justin got this photo where he pointing at the clock on them boys. <laughs> <laughs> It was brewing, boy. I had to get a lick back, dog. I was brewing, man. I was brewing. Hey, you was mad because I kept talking about that the grass I was like, hey, bro, he rolled you at World Relays, though. <laughs> listen, I was listen, the crazy thing is, you know, you never want to be that athlete that always gives excuses when you go live up to your potential. And in that race, I was actually injured, right? I had a knickknack injury when I went to World Relays, but I didn't want to give up my spot. Y'all know what it is. So I ran the semis. Well, I ran I ran the prelims and the grass rolled me, dog. He, <laughs> but never in a million years did I think that that was gonna turn into a meme that you would see on Instagram and TikTok <laughs> to this day. You know what I mean? They done put fire emojis behind him, stepping away from me and everything. I'm like, get out of here, dog. So when I had the opportunity to race him again, that was the first opportunity I raced him since that world relay. <laughs> and I had to make sure that I put one down. Nothing, nothing against Andre or anybody else that race, but listen, man, I had to, I had to scroll through my timeline and keep seeing that damn mean of me getting rolled at World Relays that one time, man. I was sick. <laughs> yeah, man. They, they put up, put up really good times. Pros, pros, and collegiate athletes alike, man. Um, one that I saw in live prime time, man, was uh, Courtney Lindsay. Courtney Lindsay ran an amazing 200, man. He, he dominated the turn, and in the straightaway, he dominated the straightaway, man. Um, he, he definitely is an athlete showing night. I just left college, but I am here. I have arrived, and I'm going to – he's showing that he's going to be here for a while, if I may say so. I would like to put Courtney Lindsay on the Ready, Set, Go watch list. I'm with you, bro. Cool. I'm with you. I'm with you. I watched him in, running a negative head when he ran 10-27, but it, 
in my head, obviously, it was a it was a, a nine second race. I think you know the winds were really strong down in Miramar. Yeah. After watching them drop that 1988, I'm going. I'm loving to see what he'll put up in the hundred, man. He he looks really strong, really strong. Shout out to Dennis Mitchell, man, who's his coach. Absolutely. Shout out to Star Athletics. Shout out to Dennis Mitchell. He's done a great job with his, his athletes coming up. They all seem to like really. He, it's like he has the, the, the key now to get all his athletes ready early. They drop really good times. You look at Melissa, uh, Melissa Jefferson dropped, just dropped what? A, a sub 11. She went 1094. Um, Courtney Lindsay did a great job. We had uh, uh, Marshall in the hurdles who just ran uh, 1245. 1245, second best time in the world right now. You know what I mean? And that comes from an era where, you know, when we were training with Dennis, he was a hurdle coach. Mm-hmm. And then at, after Kelly, he stopped doing hurdles. So for almost almost five years, he wasn't training any hurdlers. So watching him come back and bring a hurdler back to the forefront and doing a great job with it, I take my hat off to Dennis. He's doing a great job over there at Star Athletics. Can't wait mm-hmm. to see what else is coming down the pipeline over there because they get ready during Olympic year. A uh, hundred, a hundred percent. You mentioned 1245, number one in the world. Nia Ali in the hurdles. 1244 mm-hmm. was a close race, was a battle all the way to the end. But uh, national champion Nia Ali, she showed that I'm going to be a force to be reckoned with again. Oh, absolutely. Uh, she actually backdoored it with the 100 with a little bit of Gail Divas action. If anybody know me, know I love Gail Divas. If anybody, I love the media. I've never met Gail in my life, but I always thought she was like one of the best athletes of her time doing the. Uh, the dual, the dual hurdles and at an elite level and the hundred at an elite level. But uh yeah, man, she backdoored it with like an eleven twenty six hundred. She won a heat. You know what I mean? I that's a PR for him. her at the hundred too. Oh yeah? yeah that's yeah, a man. PR. It, 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 that's amazing. I, it making me think like, was she working on speed or is this something she is possibly thinking about playing with? You know what I mean? Because now, you know, a lot of the hurdlers, they they stick to hurdles. But Toby Amasan run also. She ran the hurdles also. Um, so we seeing a lot of people going from the, well, not a lot of people, the elites, running flats and running hurdles. I would love to see it again. I don't know if this Eric could sustain that because you look at the women's hundred and it's ridiculous. The top the top runners in the women's hundred are running times as it's it's a whole it's on a whole different planet, right? But to bring back that energy that Gail had, which is going out there and competing at a top level in the 100 hurdles and then competing at a top level in the 100, we know she could have won both. You know what I mean? To see a, a female hurdler in this day and age trying to achieve the same thing, I think that will be kind of cool to watch for sure. Yeah, I think I think they 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 blow it up. One thing I know about talking to a few of the elite hurdles, hurdler females, they not scared, bro. So that, what you just said, like, oh, the times look ridiculous. Like, when you talk to them, they'll be like, shoot, I just start training for it, and I'll drop down, man, shoot. But what it is, I might lose a couple, but uh, I'm going to get me somebody. They, that's how they be talking. <laughs> I was like, they, they, they have not no, scared. They, they not, not scared. scared. You know why they not scared? Because <laughs> not scared. in regular season, every race they go to is almost like an Olympic or World Championship finals. You're going to race an Olympic, uh, an Olympic champion, a world champion, or a world, previous world record holder, or current world, world record, record holder. Or current world record holder. <laughs> so every true. time you, every time these ladies race somewhere overseas, they're going to be in a hot, heavy race. So of course they ain't scared. They ready for that action, dog. A hundred, a hundred and million percent, man. Um, another thing that went well for for the USA, uh. Michelle had two four by one teams go forty one man in the in the four by one a world lead and then a second world lead they're both under her tutelage uh so that 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 was that was definitely good uh and time for the world relays so we're gonna see how the u s a females will look at world relays i mean but you they they both showed really good showings, man. Forty one ninety four and forty one ninety nine. So and this early, which is really good. This shows you the talent pool for the fem- definitely the female side that USA has. They're able to put together two relays 
that duked it out all the way around the track until even the last leg, and it became a photo finish at the last leg. So that means that she has a lot of athletes that she can plug and play and throughout the season watching them progress. I mean, you look, she's looking at the fact that she can bring her home another medal. Shout out, first of all, shout out to Michelle. No, she no. has she has done an amazing job at turning around the relay system for Team USA. Team USA has been um a system that has been laughed at for years, you know, and not taking no knocks at any coaches who came before her, but it's the fact that the system is set up to where it's trying to cater to too many athletes all at once. And we have too many athletes who are too talented. And you can't put 17 guys and 17 girls on a relay. It's only spot, it's only room for four. And if you have alternates, obviously there's room for maybe five or six. So somebody's going to miss out. And then on top of that, we don't have time to be able to get out there and practice like Team Canada, Team China, Team Japan, Jamaica, any of the other respectable teams that are out there practicing consistently, you know what I mean, almost year in, year out with their team. So what she's done right now, she's, she's created a, a great system that has flourished and it shows because she's brought home a lot of gold medals under her watch. So shout out to Michelle, man. She's doing her thing. A hundred percent. Shout out, shout out to Michelle. Um, what else was great at uh, Tom Jones? Oh, oh man, that young lady, man, that young lady. Shout, I don't know what's in the water for these young girls or the women, <laughs> but they they out there showing out, boy. Jacia Sears, ten seventy seven. Oh yeah, I forgot this man a volunteer. Go oh, God, on, baby. <laughs> Rocket top will always be home, <laughs> home to me. Woo, good old Rocket yeah, top. Yeah, man. Miss the, Sears. Uh, Miss Sears, yeah. hey. Miss Sears in the building, dog. Hey, man, she she not in the building, man. She she she's in the in the penthouse. <laughs> she's in the, in the, at ten seventy seven. Let's not forget the collegiate record is ten seventy four. It is. 1074. 1074. It is. And which was done by Shakira Richardson at Respect. Nationals in the finals. So that means we already months ahead before NCAA finals. But what can Miss Sears do between now and then? What is she? Can she hold on to that? Can she sustain that? Can she break the NCAA record before even NCs comes around? But that's, you, between, that's between her and, and Coach Dwayne Ross. You know I mean, who, who's, who's doing a really good job out there, obviously. You know, he's he's dropping a lot of these times. So I'm I'm thinking he definitely has a plan. We've seen what he's done at, at uh North Carolina A and T and he's moved on to a bigger program, a power five program now. Um and he's now just getting his getting a lot of a lot of what he wanted to bring to the table out. So between her and her coach, I'm pretty sure he got something cooking. Cause ain't nobody saw that coming. I nobody saw that coming. It looked wow. like they shot the gun twice. <laughs> like when they you shot watch, the gun for her, then they shot the gun for everybody else. <laughs> they shot the gun. <laughs> Listen, when you when you watch the video of whoever filmed that from the stands looking down, the way she accelerated through her transition and then kept on stepping in her acceleration phase, that top end phase down at the end, when she came across that line, even her teammates were surprised. Everybody was like, "Woo!" When they saw that ten seven, man. But I think is is. And I'm not sure, you know, I, I I don't know Coach Coach Ross, but it looked like she was basically executing her phases. She definitely wasn't running for time. Yeah, you know I mean, it definitely looked like she was trying to execute what she was what she's been taught. So when the time hit, you know, you know that lax moment. They're like, if you're just working on things, and in your head you're like, okay, yeah, I just tech that out. It probably is fast. You know, she probably was thinking of something like, oh, okay, maybe like 1090, you know. But I'm pretty sure when she saw 77, she was like. Oh, I, I was working on things, but I guess I really was working on things. <laughs> I was working yeah. on things, you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, that's, just, that's just a well-coached athlete um, and a great athlete, you know what I mean, going after. But that's what it really looked like. It looked like she was trying to focus on her phases and hitting them exactly the way she was coached. Yeah, she ran that race like a professional female 100-meter runner would run that race in a championship setting. That's how she yeah. ran that race. It was a beautiful run. I hope that she can keep that, sustain that through the season. 
get even faster. Um, Cause you know how it is in our sport, man. You got to seize every moment in front of you. That's going to change your life. That's going to change the trajectory of your career. So shout out to Miss Sears, man. You keep up that good work down there and go Vols, baby. There you go. There you go. So speaking that it's Olympic year, man, you know, they about to, not they about to, they have un- unveiled the USA Nike uniforms. What are your takes on it? Let me take you back first. Before I give you my take on that, think about this. When I was an athlete, and when you, when you go to Olympic trials, one of your thoughts in your mind is, I want to make this team so I can be one of the first people to wear the newest Olympic uniform. Because it's going to be cutting edge, you know, scientifically, but also just like, ain't nobody got this. You're going to be one of the first ones wearing this. So throughout my career and all my Olympics, I've loved each uniform. They've been amazing. They've been the next step. When people see it, they're like, they want it. When I saw the unveiling of this uniform, (laughs) when I saw the unveiling of this uniform, I saw it on social media first. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't part of an official page. So I actually thought it was like a prank. I had to check the calendar to make sure it was April 1st. I was like, man, this is a joke, right? Like this, this can't be the uniform that they're going to run for the next four years in. Because that's what happens. Remember, this uniform is going to be the uniform they run the next four years in. I, I, I think, <laughs> I personally think that they dropped the bag on it. They dropped the ball when it came to this situation. They should have put more money into it. They should have put more effort into it. The font across the front looked like it was just a simplified font. Like, I'm just going to pick any font, put the USA across the front. Um, color's okay. But when you look at things like the women's bottoms, <laughs> Oh, there what? was a lot. There's a lot of women who chimed in on them bottoms, boy. What? What did they say? <laughs> I read one comment. The woman was like, "The man who ever made this, after he put it on, then he could ask the women to put it on." <laughs> <laughs> Long story short, I feel like this team USA uniform has definitely missed the mark, for sure. Um, they could have did a better job with the font. Um, I felt like they just pieced together some of the some of the the material that they have for previous uniforms, and then they just threw some color on it and they just went with it. Now, the crazy thing is, Nike is the sole sponsor of making these uniforms for these athletes. Not just America, not just Team USA, but you're gonna see Kenya, you're gonna see Germany, <laughs> you're gonna see any country that is sponsored by Nike going to wear these uniforms. That's, that's how it is for Puma too. So when they unveiled the Jamaica uniform, you're just going to see that same color wave for <laughs> Trinidad, Bahamas, <laughs> and all the rest of the other Caribbean countries. It's just, all they do is remake them into different colors. So you're you right. know, it's like it's like designing easy. You make one design and then you copycat that boy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What's your thoughts on it? What's your thoughts on on the uniform? Uh, my thoughts is is, is I don't know, because what, what you just said, you know, has some 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 validity to it. It was like, it's looked like they took some of the old uniforms and put them together. But what if it's, what if the artist or the person who did it was like, this is paying homage to the past. And that was like, their, that was their thought process of why it looked like it's pieces of the old uniform brought into 2024. Well, then you got to give me a backstory when you bring when you rep, when you bring this and roll it out. You got to have a quote or something like that that goes with it, because right now it just looked like y'all just ran out of time. Y'all just started putting things together to hit the deadline. That's what it looked like. Have you ever met one of the designers? I wonder. I wonder who are the designers. Not to to get them like any type of hate or anything, but I I wonder if anybody met somebody who'd be like, oh yeah, I designed that uniform. You know I what I mean? I have not met any of the designers of the Olympic gear. I've met Nike designers before, but I've never met anybody that designed the Olympic gear. I think we all are curious to see who designed this Olympic uniform, <laughs> especially the women out there. <laughs> Boy, they, they, they are complaining that that cut is entirely too high, and they, they, they are up in arms, boy. If you read the comments on some of them things, those women are going... And these like regular, regular women. These not athletes. These like... <laughs> Who they think going to wear this? If my baby was in the Olympics, she would not dare. <laughs> she would not dare. It does not leave a lot to the imagination. Sure. 
And for those women who decide to wear that cut, that aggressive <laughs> cut, I call it aggressive <laughs> cut, <laughs> that aggressive uh, couture cut, they got to make sure they bring an emergency bottle of Nair with them because you're going to be gone <laughs> a good two weeks strong. So that that regrowth going to definitely come back. Hey, that, that's probably like, you know, like you said, couture is Paris, baby. You know what I mean? Fashion capital of the world. Fashion I don't capital. know, man. I don't know. The fun thing is, you know, when you look at something and you see it, but it makes you feel comfortable, even though it has nothing to do with you at all. Like, that's what I feel when I see that cut. I'd be like, that made me feel a little uncomfortable, dog. Like, you about to get out here and run for your life. You know what I mean? I don't, things gonna be moving. <laughs> <laughs> you just hope, you just hope you go viral for winning, not for anything else. <laughs> oh, yes, please, 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 <laughs> man. I think they got enough time. You know, I, I I don't know if they made those in mass production yet, but I don't know if they have like a, a plan B suit, but I don't know with all the, the backlash if they change anything. If not, they probably just scrap that that fit and just wear the one where it's just like the the boy short bottom for the women and then the 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 bathing suit top. They probably keep that one and probably discard the high cut one. Yeah, you know I mean that's the only thing I can see they may try to do to be like, all right, nobody does has to wear this one. What what about the women who are out there who are gonna wear it? Man, if they wear it, shoot, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be watching. <laughs> <laughs> I just playing. One ticket, just, please. One ticket, <laughs> please. <laughs> I just for play, sure. Man. So what else we got, man? That uniform definitely missed the mark for me. Shoot, we got you. We got we got a young African man saying it with his chest, man. You know what I mean? I'm I'm a fan, but oh, he talking now. He talking. The Bogo. You know it. The Bogo. That man said it is about time that the Africans dominate the sprints in this sport. Listen, I love the fact that he knows his position. And what I mean by that is he's a pioneer for young sprinters in Africa. Sprinting has always been a missing part of African athletics. When you think about African runners, you always think about distance runners, right? Mm -hmm. You think about Ethiopians, you think about Kenyans, and you don't even really, you just started a couple of years ago thinking about runners from Botswana, and now you have people like Ferdinand, who is a sprinter for Kenya. So I think that you see the evolution of athletics in Africa. And you see that people like Tobogo becoming a pioneer and the flag bearer for sprint dominance, you know what I'm saying, for the continent of Africa. I love it. I think it's beautiful. I like the fact that now he's using his stance not only to say, I'm one of the fastest people in the world and probably going to be the number one guy this year, but also the fact of he's helped bringing forward generations to come of young sprinters who can be confident. It's the same thing Usain Bolt did, I feel like. And I'm not no. taking any shot at anybody that came before Usain Bolt, but when Usain came along, he ignited such a confidence, not only in Jamaica, but the Caribbean period. It let no. all know, know that it don't matter where you come from, how small your town is, how small your country is, you can get it done if you have the talent and the discipline to get it done. And I see that happen with Tobogo. I think that's achievable in any sport, man. Like, uh, when you think about it, when you move the bar, right? He's moving the bar for the continent of Africa when it comes to sprinting. Just like you said, what you saying did for the sport after 9-5. It happened. Or even if you go back in time, the first guy to sub 10 seconds. When we thought 10 seconds was fast, and then somebody ran 9-9. Nine, nine. And we thought 9-9 nine, nine was fast, somebody ran 9-8. Nine, so as you move that bar... You know, people, once they see one person do it, they're like, shoo, shoo, he ain't, he's special, but he ain't that special. I believe I can do it too. Yeah. So now the African kid is going to look up to the BOGO. And I've seen it before, like in many countries, you're going to see a plethora of different type of youth sprinters start to run those type of times. You know what I mean? And that's how you got, shoot, it happened in the Bahamas. You had... Chris Brown running 44 low. And before him, you had like ones. But then after he started placing, then you had the rest of our 400-meter 
uh, group come along. You know what I mean? And then at to one point, we actually got the medal. Same thing in the, in the Bahamian 4x1 in 2000. We had one person run 10 seconds, and then four of them ran 10 seconds, and then we ended up getting the gold medal in 2000. So once you get that type of inspiration from one person doing it and other people feel that they can do it, you're going to see another group of, key, of people from his country that can run in almost the same time. Absolutely. Maybe not as good as him, maybe like 19, 9, 20 flat, and like maybe like 10 flat. But before we know it, I wouldn't be surprised by next, next Worlds, there's a 4 by one for his country. Oh, 100%. I would not be surprised. 100%. I was... I, th I thought he would have a four by one down in the world relays in the next couple of, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I thought, I <laughs> really thought that it was going to be a four by one about one to four by one. You know what I mean? They have the capability. He just got to, he just got to put a couple people together, a couple of guys, and they got to start just keep doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like once they get it done and keep doing it, then they'll get more experience with it too. They have more confidence that come with it as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. So yeah, that, 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 what went on to man? The boy saying it with his chest, but I told you that he's more confident. You can see it. You can see it in his runs and everything else. He's realizing that he's a beacon now. Like he is an inspiration. So it, it sounds like he just picked up the mantle. He just realized he's Neo in the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> I love That's what it sounds like. He's no longer <laughs> Mr. Anderson. He's like, it's me. You know what I mean? But yeah. in our sport, we know what it is, man. Even if he think it's him, we're going to have a, a bunch of guys that's going to show him, bro, it ain't you. It's me. You know what I mean? Hence the, the Coleman's, the Noah Lyles, the, 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 uh, uh, um, the Fred Curleys. Uh, you know, they're going to put a stop to it or try to. Yeah, you're right. But once again, he has a great track record. He already has, he already has two medals from previous yes. world championships. And that was before it was the Tobogo of before. We're looking at a different Tobogo of now. So, you know, with him having that confidence, enough confidence not only to be able to inspire himself to, to get to a new height, but for him to make a statement like that means that he definitely has a boatload of confidence because he said, look, Africa's on the map now and I'm making sure that Africa's on the map now. That's a tall order. Yeah. yeah. Shoot. We have, what we have next, man, we, that we have to talk about this weekend, what went on this weekend. We had a man. big injury, man. A big injury came across oh, uh, Rojas. breaking news. Yeah, man. Uh, heart, heart goes out to Rojas, man. Uh, Achilles, Achilles rupture for her. Uh, not too long ago, I think it happened this week, right? And, you know, when you, when you are a dominant athlete, especially in your field, we're almost to the point where you have reinvented your event <laughs> and you have become synonymous with your event. And for her to be the reigning Olympic champion and going out there, you know, you have that energy that you want to defend your title. You want to keep your legacy going. And for something like that to happen, first of all, it's not like a hamstring injury or quad tear or hip flexor injury. Like this is an injury that could end a career or change the trajectory of the rest of how your career goes. So, you know, well wishes and prayers go out to her. Hope she has a speedy recovery. Um, hope she comes back hungrier than she was before and go out there and break her records. True. But now, you know, with every, with every, queen that goes down or king that goes down, there's a rise of another. Who, who, is, who is the next Olympic champion if, she's, if this dominant force is out the way? Because we've seen it happen. Sydney McLaughlin moved aside and she took some time off and Femke Ball <laughs> exploded. <laughs> exploded. True. You know what I mean? Shawnee Miller took some time to have a baby and enjoy her family. And Polino Exploded. <laughs> Exploded. So, just like in that fashion, what happens now that Rojas, she goes down, like, like you said, God spell life, she comes back stronger than ever. Who rises? That spot is wide open to the listening athletes and everything. Who is going to be the next Olympic champion? You know what I mean? Um, 
or dominant force because we all know, shoot, you'd probably know it better than I. Uh, climbing to the top is easy. But staying at the top for that period of time and navigating staying there is very hard. You know what I mean? I like that you said that because a lot of people will probably disagree with you and say climbing to the top is not easy. When you prepare yourself to run hard, run fast, and compete at a high level, climbing to the top is pretty easy. You just have to be consistent, you know what I'm saying, with your competition. When you get out there, you have to be consistent with your competitiveness. And then by the time you look up, you really one of those dogs who's sitting at the top because you worked hard for that. But like you said, staying at the top is the hard part. Because now when you're at the top, what's going to be in question is your integrity, your consistency, but also what habits. A lot of athletes have habits that they push to the side to get to the top, but then those habits start to come back because now you become a little lax. You'd be like, ah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm good. I'm the man. I'm the woman. You know what I mean? I can go out, party, have a good time. But then while you're doing all those kind of things, those people who were behind you trying to jog for a position that you beat out for that position, they're still working. They're still trying to build themselves up to beat you to get that spot. So, yeah, holding that position is a hard place to stay, you know, for sure. I think um, to what you just said, a lot of a lot of athletes or I mean, I don't even think that could be an athlete thing. I think that could be a life thing. You know what I mean? Success and sacrifice goes hand in hand. A lot of people don't understand what that means. You will have to sacrifice something for your success, whether it be family time, whether it be where you put the alcohol bottle down, where you put the fast food down, where you, you know, you have to let some friends go. You know what I mean? You have to walk alone for a while. Those type of sacrifices you have to do on when you're climbing your way to the top. But what makes that easier is if, if, if nobody expects you to be the guy to be at the top. Because nobody's, that light isn't on you at all. You know what I mean? They just is like, oh, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And then boom, then you're here. So the reason why I may say, and you probably could expound on this a little bit, uh, it's harder to stay at the top is once you have the lights, camera, action, now everybody's tugging on your coattail. Can you take this picture? Can you do this photo op? Can you do this interview? Now your focus level is not the same because now you are training in the dark. You remember when you was coming back and you told me about it, just training in the dark, training like an animal, like a caged animal. And then you turned into a beast. But you had to, you had to train like the animal first. Your mind you know had I mean? to be there first before you get your body there. Exactly. So now, yeah. you know, once you're at the top, you, you possibly, if you don't have the right mindset, could turn into a pampered pooch. <laughs> 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 Am I lying? Hey, you ain't lying, though. You're right. Because now money is not an option anymore. Yeah. You have the attention. You definitely have options and. If 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 you like girls or, or guys to pick, not you liking guys, but I'm just saying like female or male, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh, so that's not like a, a thing. So talk to, and you probably could use this part to tell somebody how to navigate stardom or how did you navigate stardom once it got to you? There's two, tip, there's two type of winners. There's a winner who wants to win once and then they don't care. They want to get that Olympic gold medal, what they worked hard for, what they dreamed about as a kid. They want to make it to the top. They want to get on top of that podium. They want to have that medal around their neck. They want to hear the national anthem play, and then they're done. They want that medal. That's it. They didn't think past that any further to think, I'm the man or I'm the woman now, and I got to keep up this same routine of being the winner. Then their mind starts thinking like, I didn't, I didn't prepare for this moment. I didn't prepare to keep on being the winner. So that's why you see a lot of people come and go. That's why you see a lot of winners win once and then they can't win again or they can't duplicate their dominance because they never, it was never in their playbook to even do so. You feel me? But now the other type of winner is those people who are obsessed with the process. The ones who want to win and want to keep winning. It's not necessarily about the gold medal or the accolades, it's the fact that they want to go through that same process of feeling like they're unstoppable, unbeatable. They want to feel all the way from that hard work from November, that fall training, 
that grind, that speed endurance training through January, that precise training through February, March, and then they want to be unleashed to go out there and compete at a high level and beat all their competitors over and over and over again. Those are the two type of winners that you have. So when you watch, when you watch people go out there and you say, oh man, they ain't never, hey, why they do that? Why, why we ain't see that person anymore? You got to ask yourself that question. Do they really want to win three Olympic medals or do they just really want to win one? That's really what it comes down to. And I hope y'all listening, man, especially in this new age, man. Um, we live in that little microwave, microwavable society. All the young athletes want everything now. They're not obsessed with a process or trying to get through a process to get something done. You know what I mean? Um, but you have to be obsessed with your craft. You got to keep tooling and tooling. We live in an age where I want it now. You know, if, I, if I'm running 10-1, I want to run 9-9 tomorrow. Okay, if you run 9-9 <laughs> tomorrow, then what? Then what? Exactly. If you do that, you're going to ex be expected to do it again. And if you can't do it again, then what? You know what I mean? So yep. I can understand definitely what you just said, man. So yeah. I, I, I thank you for sharing that with our, with our, with our RSG family. Of um, course. What else we got on the docket? Man, I mean, World Relays is around the corner, man. Bro, you excited relays. about it? Yeah, man, it's home. It's in the Bahamas, man. I two, know, four, man. Two, what it do. You know what I mean? Um, so we're going to let the audience know that we are going to be officially in, in person at the World Relays. In the Bahamas. Yes, we will be there. Justin and I, RSG, will be in the building, man. We're going to definitely try to uh, talk to some folk pick some minds, you know what I mean? And get some information for our fans, man, to develop our community. We definitely want to grow our sport and, and show it to the world. You know what I mean? So the third, the fourth and the fifth of next month, World Relays in Nassau, Bahamas. Uh, if you don't have your ticket, please book, book your ticket and try to get down there. I'm, I'm excited, boy. We going, we going to your home. Yeah, I mean, it's your, it's your home, you know what I mean? Like, it's like my second home. You know what yeah. I mean? It's my second home because, you know, I'm I'm from the Bahamas, but I'm not from that part. I get you know? it. I get it. <laughs> I get it. You got to let it be known because everybody that's from the Grand Bahamas is going to be like, hold on, yeah. how you do it? They're going to be like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. They're going to suck their teeth at you, then. Listen, my, dad, my dad's from Nassau. You know what I mean? My dad's okay. born and raised um, in Nassau from Fox Hill. Yeah, my dad's from Fox Hill, so shout out to Fox Hill. For sure, for sure. Man. <laughs> so once we get there, not only are we going to get there and see some great relays, some great races, interact with the crowd, interact with other athletes, we also want to invite some of the athletes to come on to the show, be able to yes. sit down with us, talk a little track shop, talk about a little about their determination, their mindset, what the Olympic year looks like for them, the future too. But also, man, let's get out and, and, and see a bit of the culture. Let's eat oh, a little yeah, bit man. of conch fritters, yeah, have man. some conch salad. Let's yeah, go to uh, Andro. What is it? Oh, Andros? <laughs> Andros is, is a way. But shoot, you can get some more food, man. Some fried fish, some fried snapper. You know what I mean? We we, we definitely got to eat, man. Some crab and rice. Uh, you remember last time you had <laughs> you that, that, you bro, that? You remember the last time we went down there? It was like <laughs> the last day, bro. We was there for like, what, three days, four days? Yeah, and I, and I think I took you through everything we eat. And I think your question was, was bro, do, do Bahamians eat vegetables? <laughs> he was like, bro, I feel like I need to detox when I get back. Listen, everything I ate for a whole week was fried, dog. I was like, I had to ask the chef. I was like, y'all don't even, I just need a salad. Y'all have, have a salad? I just need something, a salad, man. <laughs> Oh, man. But I'm ready oh, this man. time, man. I'm going to do all my detox before. I'm going to eat all my salads before I get down there because I'm going crazy to get down there. I want to I wanna get all <laughs> the good delights, all hey, the delicious food. Hey, de definitely, man. Listen, go to get chicken in the bag and all that. So, you know, What is that, bro? You didn't hit me with that last time. It's, What's chicken in the yeah, bag? Chicken in the bag, man. It's down there at Bamboo Shack. Shout out to Bamboo Shack. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Like, you're going to see when we get there. You and I'm gonna come back, boy. I'm gonna come back fat, boy. That's what you're doing. <laughs> come back fat. It might be okay though. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, might... De definitely, definitely. Hold on, hold on. I also need 
Uh, you know what else I need that we don't get in America? Guava duff. What is that? You ain't, I didn't give you guava duff last time it was here? You probably did. I don't even remember. <laughs> What's a guava duff? That sounds like a Pokemon, dog. Who is it? I choose uh, guava duff. <laughs> It, it, it's like a breaded, a bread like the fruit guava, and like a a breaded, a breaded loaf with a special sauce that we put on the top. It's like a dessert. So you definitely. So now like y'all they're making fried fruit fruit now. <laughs> <laughs> nah, <bro. laughs> I'm gonna take some. I'm a, I'm gonna take some guava duck. So I'm gonna okay. partake in that too. It's good uh, though. But you know what I do need? With that, I need some of that white henny. Oh yeah, yeah, we got that, we got that, we got. We need that. some of that white Hennessy, man. We, we got that, and, and I know your wife loved that mango rum. <laughs> really, I, I'm gonna try some of that too, there. <laughs> I'm gonna try some of that too, there. The Ricardo Ricardo mango rum, you could only get it home. It's, it's it's definitely amazing. Listen, man, I'm gonna get that cart right. You know when you a tourist and you about to leave to go back onto that boat or get back on that plane, you at the duty free. <laughs> I'm gonna go right off to that shelf and just and just go protect my arm across that shelf and just put it all, slide it all into my cart, dog. I'm taking like eight bottles home with me. Yeah, I, I'm gonna be right there with you because I can't get it here. I always tell my mom to bring it, but she a minister, so she'd be <laughs> like, "I can't let nobody see me with alcohol on the plane." The spirits. I'd be like, I'd be like nobody care about that, man. We better bring my alcohol. <laughs> And you're like, you see Miss Green over there with the spirits? <laughs> you see Pastor Green with the spirits over there? <laughs> yeah, man. But it's going to be good to go home, man. Shoot. Uh, we, have any, we have anything in our mailbag? Mailbag time. Mailbag time. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll start off the mailbag. We got a couple, of, a couple on the list. First one we have, shout out to Leo. Leo hit us up and said, says, in regards to uh, USA trials, being only the the only country with 9.9 athletes to watch the Olympics from home. The only country. What about Jamaica? So I think what he's saying here is, you know, we, and we're really taking this in real time. So this is how people are writing it. So Leo, mm. I think what he's saying is the fact is, yes, at USA Olympic trials, our talent pool is so deep that you could run 9-9, nine, nine, not make the team, and you would be sitting at home watching the Olympics. But what about Jamaica? What's your I, thoughts on that? I mean, right now, right now, I think I don't, I don't, it's not as dominant as it used to be. You know what I mean? I mean, if he's speaking about the, the, the Jamaican era where you had the Nikhil Ashmeys, Usain Bolt, South of Powell, Mike Freda, Johan Blake. You know what I mean? That era, yes. Yes, if he's speaking about that era, definitely that was the hardest era of track and field, not just in Jamaica, but shoot, Jam- Jam- and Nesta Carters. It was hard for the rest of the world to beat the Jamaicans too, not just the Jamaicans to beat the Jamaicans. <laughs> Facts. So, I was there. So, but right now, like, I think the women's side is like that because right now you got the big three. And Sharika, Shelly Ann, and Elaine, you know, what What does that 100 meter final look like for Jamaica? Like, you could possibly have a young lady run 10, 8, 10, 9 and get seventh if, 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 if the big three is healthy. Absolutely. You You're right. You could 100%. have somebody, uh, let, let's not forget, you have a 10, 5 and two 10, 6 ladies, you know what I mean, in Jamaica that are still currently competing. We ain't talking about one that retired and then one who possibly be, all of these ladies as recently in the last four years have achieved their times. It's safe to say that they, they are still in their primes. All three uh, of them are still in their primes. A hundred percent. And so my take on it is you got to really look at the fact that there are errors, right? And USA... It's, it's harder to see USA's errors of, of sprint dominance because what happens is our colleges are also incorporated into our Olympic trials or our nationals. So now you have athletes who have the capabilities of running nine nines, nine eights now, and most likely won't make the team because you have those athletes already standing in the way, like a Trayvon Bramell or 
a Fred Curley or a Marvin Bracey. So, you know, and the list goes on. Christian Coleman's, Noah Lyles. So it's a, it's a long list of professional athletes who have already been dominating the sport, who understand how to run or that's under that pressure and can go to Olympic finals or Olympic trials finals and still produce in that way. And, and their training peaked them to that point. Usually when you have college athletes, they've, they've peaked already for NCAAs. And so now what happens is their coach has to re-peak them within that month's time to get ready for the Olympic trials or nationals. So they can go and make the team. So, but for my my take on when it comes to making Team Jamaica, it's that same thing. So now you have so you have Asaf who's, who's retired, you have Usain Bolt who's retired. Now the the uh, the OG of it is Johan Blake, but then at the same time you have a lot of these guys who have made their mark, like Akeem, Oblique, Hudson, Deshaun. Like, these guys are capable of running 9.8s, and they've already ran 9.8s. Yeah, they have already done still, it. And still dominate. Now, there's a lot of up-and-coming Jamaican runners who are probably right behind them who are going to run 9.9, 10.0, and they're probably going to be sitting at home watching because they only can take three. You know what I mean? mean? And, and when you go to that list... You have one, two, three, four already. Akeem, Oblique, Hudson, Ishan, that's four. And, and Somebody's a, not going to make that 100-meter Olympic team. At a, at a Nationals, you always have an outlier for Jamaica or the Bahamas. There's always one person who, who you probably missed, and they just show up at trials, and they do something. <laughs> they do something. And it's, ha- it's happened many a times. We, Melissa Jefferson, when she ran a 10-6 and won you, uh, uh, Charlton, Charleston, I think is his name. Yeah, he won, Trayvon he, Charleston. Yeah, when he won, like, there's people who, like, they're not names, but they're climbing those ranks. You know what I mean? Who's an outlier who may just be coming around that year who you may not be thinking of, who may put somebody out of that spot. So, you know, who, who, who knows in Jamaica who it could be this year or – in the USA, who it could be this year, you know, because those are definitely two dominant countries who dominate the sprints. Like it's it's very hard, you know what I mean. Otherwise, they wouldn't have at pen relays USA versus the world. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, they used to, it used to be Jamaica and the USA with that four by one for years. Yeah. So one thing I, I'm loving about Jamaica right now is the fact that all of their top sprinters are young athletes all within that same generation. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, excluding Yoha Blake, all these top athletes, the name, guys I named already, that means that the next couple of tr- uh, championships, from world championships to the next Olympics to the world championships, these guys are going to mature together. They're going to sh- they're going to sharpen iron. They're going to go out there at nationals, Olympic trials. They're going to they're going to go out there and fight each other every chance they get to be the top dog of their country. And to really think about it, bro, in the next couple of years, you're looking at Team Jamaica being a formidable four-by-one relay once again for jockeying for that top position. Because like I said, you got Keyshawn who already ran a 9-8 before. You got Akeem and Oblique who already showed that they can be, you remember, just last year, we actually had, was it Akeem? We had Akeem to actually win. He was going to be on that podium. So yeah. he he was considered a favorite. So you, when you yeah, look at that situation, give them another year. Things may change. Hey, look, you do. That is true. But that Keyshane actually shook things up, though. He came out of nowhere last year. <laughs> well, the year before, he came slowly the year before, and then he exploded last year. You know what I mean? So yeah. he, he, and he running 9 8, he on Coleman Hills, like, He's not just running 9-8. Because I always think that running fast and running fast against formidable formidable competitors are two different things. You know what I mean? Because sometimes you could be in shape and be scared by a name. You know what I mean? That young man's not scared by a name. He was banging with bangers. Noah Lyles, Kristen Coleman was in those races where he ran his 9-8. You know what I mean? Yeah. He didn't run it by himself all the way out or in front of people. He actually competed and, and made that happen. So... 
Yeah, that, that he's one of those outliers, man. But he, he's not an outlier anymore because we know who he is. <laughs> Very true. All right, what else we got in the mailbag? We got uh, we got what does this young man ask? This man said, "All in the game." Dwayne Stevenson, that's his name. Okay. Remember, Asafa didn't run in the relays then. Imagine if Asafa at nine seven two, the best starter, would have been. Oh, the world record would have been thirty six seven. I I actually think it'll be faster. I actually think it'll be, I actually think it'll be thirty six, thirty six five. I mean, I ain't gonna argue with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we talking if you're. If you're talking, I call that nine seven Asafa. There's a video that shows the side profile of of Asafa running nine seven two, and literally, I, you say that's God mode Asafa. That's God mode Asafa. I mean, he moves through his drive phase and transitions so smoothly, comes through the finish line and bends the quarter like a. Like, like, like that, like, like he just ran the fastest rep he had at practice. That's yeah. what he makes it look like. And it look, he makes it look so easy and so effortless. Like Man. he's just a, a a great practice day. That's how that, he makes it look like it. That that thing was so beautiful because there's no herk and jerk. It just looks so smooth and flowy. You know what I mean? The only other runner who I could definitely say ran clean to me. Like that to me, in my opinion, to me, it was Maurice Green. That man made the hundred meter look beautiful, boy. He did. Like they they have a front shot and a side shot of this man running his his, his hundred. Mo Green is my guy, boy. That I call him textbook hundred meter running, boy. If I, if they taught a class, they could teach phases based on Maurice Green. That that man that, yeah. But yeah, in that race right there. But Asafa made that race look beautiful, that 972. I call that God mode Asafa. Exactly. <laughs> but what listen, I'm not trying to be controversial here. So are we talking about when they did break the world record in 2012? Because that's the case, God mode Asafa was not in 2012. You see what I'm no. saying? Are we talking no. about plug and play Asafa of that time period into the relay? I think that's what he's talking about. Cause he was he says. He says in his in his question, he says, imagine a Safa at nine seven two, the best height. So he's saying, imagine him in that. Yeah, that's how I'm interpreting it. Imagine nine seven two a Safa. So that's what I'm thinking. I mean, yeah, but now we're going into fantasy realm, right? And what I mean by that oh, is, hey, right, no, here we no, go. No, but no, what I'm saying <laughs> is because the last time we had this, and I, I had to go back and look at our own episode and say, wait a minute. Usain was in 9-6 shape. Johan was in 9-7 shape. Nestor was in 9-8 shape. Prater was in 9-9 nine, nine shape, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we can go out and say they're best PRs. But that didn't equate to that time, which no, it makes it even more impressive. It, it makes it, it even it, way it more impressive because after running the 100, all the rounds, the 200, they still, half of that team still came back and put down a hellified relay to go out there and break the world record. You know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a few factors, and, and you could definitely talk about it. It's a few factors that you, you have to take into consideration. The adrenaline of the crowd. You know what I mean? That, that alone jacks you up. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you may be sore. You may have a little nicks and necks. But once you run out there... And they're that crowd, and they screaming, yo, you ain't say, or Jamaica, or whatever. You you gassed up. Like, you, those endorphins start tingling in your body, and you be like, what what hip? Or what toe? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> you know why, though, that that is, though? Because there's a difference between being an individual runner at the Olympics or World Championships, and you go out there, and you don't run your best race. Everyone's like, damn, what happened to him? Oh, man, hope he gets better. or he, he ain't in. He ain't in the finals, right? He ain't get on the podium. So you're looking at it from a, you're looking at it as as a spectator from a and you're looking at him as an individual. But then when you look at all four of those individuals 
on a relay, if you go out there and falter, it ain't on your back. It's on the country's <laughs> back. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, People will look and be like, oh, man, take him off the relay, dog. He messed it up. <laughs> he messed it up. <laughs> now you got dudes who got PTSD about a relay. <laughs> oh, 100%, boy. 100%. 100%, for sure. Speaking of relays, let's talk about the next... Let's talk about the next um, the next mailbag question. It actually goes back to the relays. All in the game. Shout out to All in the Game. He says, I'm curious as what Jamaican team you will put out there and what's the order you will put out there. Starting with Akeem, Oblique, Hudson, and Keyshawn. How would you put that in order? Would you keep it that way or would you change the order up? I'm going with, um, let me look at it again. I'm going to go with Oblique. I'm going to go with Seville at the hole. I, I love the way Keyshane run, well, man. I put him second leg. Um, put Hudson on that turn. He's, he's a 200 guy. Oh, yeah. Put Hudson on the turn. And then um Blake on the Cause I put I put Oblique out the hole, right? Oblique yeah. out the hole and, and Blake at the end. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Blake, I agree Blake, with you. Blake is Blake is good for in, insurance. He's a fighter, man. I've I've seen him warm up and I've seen him at a couple of meets. Um he got dog in him. Yeah. So he 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 not folding. He he not if he get the stick in front. It's, it's hard for me to see him getting ran down, even by uh, uh, even by Noah Lyles. It's, it's hard. I, I'm I'm pretty sure Noah would beg to differ, but uh-huh. <laughs> it's hard for me to for me to see him getting run ran down. Yeah. So I agree with you 100 percent with that order. That actually is a really good relay, dog. <laughs> it is. That's a it good is. relay. Bro, bro, relays we gonna see. We haven't seen. I don't know if Jamaica selected their team yet, but you know we gonna see what numbers people put up at these at world relays, man, and uh, and, and what what it's like. We we definitely will be talking about it while we're there. So we have one more in the bag. You want to take it? You want me to take it? Go ahead, you take it. Saint GC for life. You guys need to bring. In more guests, especially one who compete who competed against you. I think that I question's more more so for you, but uh, <laughs> more so for you. But we do have we do have more guests coming. Uh, I don't want to unveil them yet, but we do have more guests who actually signed up for the show. We think was definitely be an interesting take on backstories. Like when y'all hear some of these backstories of. Some of these great athletes, y'all would be like, wow. <laughs> you know what, Doug? I think from that question, I want to take the opportunity and especially to GC answer his question, but also to the audience, man. You know, since we started this podcast, it wasn't because it was anything for us. It was the fact that we just love track and field. You know what I mean? I love running. I love competing in track and field. I love help consulting and coaching in track and field. I love watching track and field. If I had an opportunity to sit down just as an individual and talk to certain athletes of my past I competed with, them, you know what? I'd love to have you saying on the show. I think it'll be an amazing experience to talk about our battles throughout our career, um, our perspective of each other as opponents. Um, I would love to have, I would love to ask him questions that have always been in the back of my head that I I won't I won't unveil now, but if we have the opportunity to sit down with him. It would be all love, dog. I think it'll be a great show. We'd be laughing. We have a great time. True. So, Everybody, tag tag Sir Usain Bolt and let him know that we would love an episode. Even if not, even we would love an episode with just him and Justin, just to see what they think while they were battling during those times. So if you're listening, or if this Instagram turns into a one-time post, tag Sir St. Leo 
you sent him home. <laughs> For sure. And let him know. <laughs> and, te- and tell him that we would come to Jamaica to do this. We will come to him. Jamaica, and have this Jamaica. episode. You know, it's definitely time for me to have a vacation. And you know what? I haven't been to Jamaica. <laughs> I haven't been to Jamaica since 2013. Seriously. When you raced? The last time I've been to Jamaica is when I raced. That's crazy. Come on, man. First of all, I was public enemy number one for a long time in Jamaica, dog. But you know what's funny, though? Every Jamaican that, that speaks to me about our show, they love you. They And I, I don't know, unless you know some gang in Jamaica that looking out to try to get you. But <laughs> even in the comments, man, like you have so much, they have so much respect for you. Now, the only place I would look out for you in, like if we was to go there, I would be kind of uneasy is Great Britain. <laughs> it's, the, it's the UK. I well, mean, like, hey man, we, we might need to call our bodyguard buddies to, to come with us. <laughs> well, you know, we just did our analytics and our analytics show that our number one city that watches our show is actually Kingston, Jamaica. Hey, Jamaica, which is, Jamaica. So shout out to Jamaica. And you <laughs> know what? I have fond memories of being in Jamaica. In 2005, I went out there and trained extensively in Jamaica for like almost half a month, dog. It is, it was amazing. Went to the beaches, ate the foods, had some tasties, enjoyed myself, man. I would love to be able to kind of go back to Jamaica, have a beautiful time. And just like, not even just go like to like the real vacation spots where everybody go to and be like, oh, I've been in Jamaica, you know, also Rios and everything. I'm talking about Kingston, the heart. You know what I mean? That's really where Jamaica is. That's really where the vibe is, just to go down there and really experience it once again, especially after retiring. So now it's like, Jamaica, I appreciate y'all showing me so much love. You know what I mean? Like me being the fierce competitor was only for the fact because I know that you respect fierce competitors. And I couldn't be anything but that. So shout out to Jamaica. Thanks for showing us so much love. Thanks, Kingston, for showing us so much love and fanfare. We appreciate you. And once again, if y'all had an opportunity, reach out to Mr. Uh, Mr. Usain Bolt himself. Tell him that we'd love to have him on the show. Michael Fred, hell, we would love to have the whole relay on the show. Michael Fred and Johan Blake, Asafa, Asafa, come on the show. But we have so much history from 2003 on. Love to have you on the show, man. Um, Everyone else, man. The ladies, too. I'd love to have oh, Shelly on oh, the show. Oh, yeah. You Shelly, know what I mean? Yeah. Elaine, Sharika. Yeah. Sharika. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, all, all, of the, all, of the, all of the young ladies, man. Even the young ladies of the past, man. Veronica. Listen, I'm pretty sure Veronica has, like, so many stories, man. Veronica was one of my favorite uh, Jamaican men. I actually know her and her husband. Man, but like, like when you dial into her mind, she is so fierce, real soft spoken, but really so fierce, like real dog. You know, I'm gonna definitely try to get her on there, man. Real queen, graceful. You know what I mean? But before the Shelly Ann's and Elaine's, it was it was BC. Veronica, it was BCB. <laughs> and let me tell you, bro, it was at a time that I watched her train almost every day. She would train right across the track from us. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> I never understood how someone could have be so fierce and go out there train by themselves. At that point in time, remember, you remember, she had no training partners. No training partners, zero. She would train by herself. She would go out there and hit the times, hit the marks, and just be so fierce with her training as if she was really competing against another individual right next to her. And in my mind, I'm thinking, like, how do you even keep up pace? How do you even know what pace is? Because you're not running against anybody. You're, no one's out there to push you. But she would go into track meets and she'd go out there and still lay those 10 eights, 10 sevens, and she'd go out there and still dominate and still run fast, bro. So True. yeah, it's it's it, it is Veronica, but you know, she had she had a good coach too in Lance Brahman. You know what I mean? He brought her, I think he came with her from Barton to Arkansas to Pro. So, you know, we gotta give him some credit too. <laughs> absolutely you gotta give him credit for sure with that being said that's our mailbag for today man I think we can wrap it up from there bro yeah, so man. you wanna take us out yeah man next time for all our fans hey send more mailbags we love those type of questions man we love the interaction um, we usually interact in the comments but until next time on our next show on ready set uh, go, go!